Hi, this is Misha. And this is another comparison or versus series. In the first three episodes, we kind of looked at um, opposing guns from different combatants of World War II. You know, we had we looked at uh, the Russian Mosin versus the German Mauser. We looked at the U.S. 1903A3 versus the Japanese Type 99 Arasaka. We looked at the British Enfield Number no. Four versus the Carcano. M38 because why not? For episode 4 I thought I'd mix it up a bit, go to World War 1 and also compare two guns that served side by side. We have here the US model of 1903 Springfield 30-06. This was the original version uh, that the A3 replaced during World War 2. And we have the U.S. model of 1917, often called the U.S. Enfield. And I'll talk a little bit about this one's history because we haven't really done a video just on this gun. It, it has appeared in many videos, but it kind of ends up getting sidelined, which is honestly kind of, <laughs> kind of fitting in a way because that's what happened to it a lot in history. <laughs> but uh, this became a substitute standard for America during the First World War. These served alongside each other and it's often asked which was the better gun? The 1903 or the 1917? Well the 1903, let's look at here, this was designed and manufactured at the Springfield Armory beginning in 1905 there were several various updates, yada, yada, yada. Springfield would keep building these and through the 1930s. It was also put into manufacturing at the Rock Island Armory, which he would build them up through about 19, 1920, when the Rock Island Arsenal would close, and then some uh, Rock Island receivers and whatnot would be moved to Springfield for final assembly in the late 20s to have supplemental rifles, so on and so forth. And in World War II, actually, A3 excuse me, 1903 production would begin again in 1941 at Remington, who took over the tooling from the old Rock Island line. And this would transition into the 1903 Modified, which was a streamlined version for the war, and then eventually the A3 that you saw in Episode 1. So this actually was made quite a bit longer than the 17. What we have here is a short rifle, same specs as the A3. We have a 24 inch barrel. We're about 44 inches overall. We're about eight and three quarters pounds. We hold five rounds of 30-06, typical turn bolt system. It is based on the 1893 Mauser. We have the caulking piece kind of from the Craig. We have a straight stock. Now, original stocks would have uh, finger grooves. This is a replacement because this gun was re reissued for World War II. We have very fancy pants sights. I'm going to point this at you folks. We have, you slide them up, kind of lock her in there for elevation. We have a knob here for windage. So it is hand adjustable. It doesn't require a tool. And these are, put it around notch type sights. As you see, they're mounted at the rear of the barrel, the front part of the receiver section. The handguard is full length, sling swivel, stacking swivel, bayonet lug. The front sight is a blade with a protective hoop. This just comes off, so it's not really a permanent part. Pretty standard bolt action rifle. And this was standard issue before World War I. America had manufactured about 850,000 prior to the U.S. getting involved in that war. So not an insignificant number, but not near enough for the needs of that war. In comes the 1917. This gun traces its roots a few places actually. 
It too is based on the Mauser system. It's a cock on close though. This was originally designed in Britain and was the pattern 1913, which at the time was going to be a new 0.276 rimless high velocity round. They wanted to replace the Lee Enfield and the 303 round, which had a rim. But they had some issues with the, the, the P-13 and then World War I began. So they quickly went to the pattern 1914, which was basically the same gun, but reworked hastily to fire 0.303, the standard round at the time. They tried manufacturing at Vickers. It didn't work out. All other British factories were pretty much tied up with other, other things because of the war. So what they ultimately ended up doing was contracting with Winchester and Remington in the US to build these. It took a little time to get production up and running, but eventually the P-14 would be made in large numbers in America. Remington and Winchester would make them. Also, Remington would set up another plant called Eddystone to make additional rifles. 1916, America was delivering large numbers of P-14s to Britain. And if you're interested in that, that's the story for another video. But that meant that there were production lines at two factories. So 1917, U.S. gets involved in the war. It needed more 1903s. Springfield and Rock Island were not able to produce enough to meet the needs. First, they thought about getting Remington and Winchester to retool to make the 1903. But this would have taken a lot of time. And, you know, more tooling, more, just, you know, yeah. So they thought, they thought, well, we can just look at the 19. 14, the, the, the P-14 and 303, let's see how we can rechamber it for 30-06. And actually it was a very easy process. Because the gun had originally been designed for a high velocity rimless round, the receiver and bolt were already overbuilt, and it liked the rimless round even more than the rimmed round, so going to the rimless 30-06 was, was pretty easy. And of course, we're still 30 caliber bore, so not a huge change there. In fact, they still use the five, uh, five groove rifling. One benefit to going to the new 30-06 rimless over the 303, the P-14 held five cartridges in this Mauser style magazine, whereas the 1917 could hold an additional round for a total of six. Now this is a bit of a heavier gun and a longer gun. We're at about 46 and a half inches with a 26 inch barrel. And we're weighing in at just under nine and a quarter pounds. So about a half pound more than the O3. As I said, it's a Mauser system. We have a protected front sight. We have open top though, blade. Bayonet lug, swivel, uh, st uh, stacking swivel here, full length upper handguard again, sling swivel. This has the grooves in the stock. Interestingly, the P14 did not, so this was one of the changes for the 17. Notice there's no rear sight here. It is located on the back of the receiver here. Oops, I knew I was going to do that. It's always a matter of time. It is a peep sight, not a notch. It does flip up. It is adjustable. For elevation, but it's not really adjustable for windage, certainly not in the field. So it's not as a finely adjustable of a sight as the O3, but it is with a longer sight radius and a peep. The safety is here, it's kind of infield style, thumb safety. There is no mag feed cutoff, whereas on the O3 over here, our safety is a very typical Mauser style cock this out. Safety here. And then get it here, guys. There you go. Bolt safety. If you notice, it basically has to be with the bolt cocked to have it on. We do have a feed cut off. It's over here. This is actually down as off up is where we can feed from our magazine middle would actually be disassembly. 
This has a straight stock in the back. Whereas the Enfield has the kind of British semi-pistol grip stock. Both have storage compartments for a cleaning kit and do not rely on a cleaning rod. So which was better? Well, in World War I, as is quite famously known, more of these critters were made. And more were in the field over in Europe. They were able to get these turned out. We have three factories, Remington, Eddystone, Winchester making them. They had already made a large number for Britain, so they knew what they were doing. It didn't take long to get these in the field. The design was already quite perfected. They didn't go through the heat treat issues that the Springfields did. You know, Springfield production was halted when they discovered that there were, some guns had improper heat treating. So that left the 1917 to basically be shipping by itself for a few months. And that really meant more of these got into the field. In fact, they turned out over 2,200,000 just between 1917 and 1918. Now with the 1903, total production was about 1,300,000. Now, part of that, though, was produced early in World War II by Remington. But they still turned out a large number. Like I said, they had over 850, or a little under 850,000 before the war. And they continued to make them after the war. They would build, you know, roughly another half million. But still, more of the 1917s. The majority would be, would be built by Eddie Stone, like this one just under 1.2 million. And then Winchester and Remington would split the other million between them. A little over four, 450,000 Winchesters, a little under 550,000 Remingtons. You get the idea. Which is better? I want to say the 1917. I've always had a soft spot. This was kind of the underdog rifle when I was young. People were always looking for O3s. The 1917s were quite cheap and available. And this gun has always been plagued by the not from here stigma. In Britain, the P14 was kind of second lined because the Enfield was not only designed in Britain but made there. Whereas the P14, while designed in Britain, wasn't made there. And then the M1917 pretty much experienced the same fate in America. It was designed in Britain, even though it was made here. So it kind of had a foreign aesthetic. You know, it, it, it looks very British because that's where it was designed. So it was kind of discriminated against, but it was a good gun. It was very durable, very overbuilt, nice kind of dog leg bolt. I really like this safety. I like that it can also be turned on when it's not cocked. It's just very easy to use. The bolt comes out just as easily for cleaning, very chunky. They're both based on Mausers, so that's the same. This holds six cartridges as opposed to five. The trigger is perfectly good. The longer sight radius, well, the sights weren't as good at target sights, match grit sights, but they were better battle sights. And I, I can say this pretty objectively because the U.S. would go to this style of sight on subsequent guns and went grand and went carbine, 1903, A3 even. So obviously they felt that the sights were pretty good. They would even go to the receiver, rear receiver mounting instead of the barrel. So the sights were better. However, it is longer and it is heavier and this can't be ignored. So there is that sacrifice to it. The Springfield is lighter, a little easier to carry around. The US, on the other hand, definitely preferred the Springfield. As soon as World War I was over, they halted production of the 1917. And very, very quickly, within a couple of years, declared them obsolete. I mean, they, they declared guns that weren't even issued as obsolete. Most were put into long-term storage or given away to U.S. allies later during the Lend-Lease program as well or sold off by the DCM, the forerunner of the CMP. 
either way, they quickly got as many of the 1917s out of the system as they could after World War I. In fact, there were only a handful of units that still had the 1917 come World War II, even when America really needed rifles. These were mostly like artillery men and mortar crews, people that really didn't need a rifle as a primary gun. They definitely selected the 1903. That's why Springfield kept it in more or less limited production through the 20s and 30s. And then Remington started production back up. So it's very clear that America preferred the 1903, but it was mostly because of the whole America thing. Even though you know, it's based on a Mauser, which is kind of a German thing. And a lot of Americans still preferred these match sights. This was the whole era of riflemen, precision shooting, even though they're not as good at combat sights, their efficacy as match sights was still popular amongst some. In a lot of other ways, these guns are so similar, though it's not even worth talking about. I mean, the bolt throw, the trigger, all that's about the same. So, which was better? Me, I'd have to go, I'd say I like the infield a little more. I like the history behind it. I like the look. I like the feel. But I wasn't a doughboy hauling one through trenches. Maybe if I was, I, and, you know, patriotism there too, I would feel a little more confident with the Springfield. But the 1917 definitely didn't let American soldiers down during the war. And many survived the war because of it. But the U.S. preferred the 1903, which is why it became an American classic and was acclaimed. And there were still a large number of 03s in production and even in use, especially early on in World War II and especially in the Pacific. Some were still around in Korea as well, but by, by that point they were very much second line. Again, kind of with artillery crews and other non-combatants, more or less. I thought this might be an interesting versus because we're looking at two guns that serve together in the same nation. Let me know what you think in the comments, please, if you preferred the first format where we compare opposing guns, or if you kind of like it when we compare guns used by the same, uh, same nation, or at least at the most maybe allies. Just like I said at the beginning of this series, just playing around with the format. And I thought it would be neat, and we haven't really focused on this good old 1917 too much, and I wanted to give it some, some history, because uh, in Britain, too, the P-14 really got short-shifted and put into reserve and, and home guard use. It, it didn't... It's a shame, because a lot was put into designing this gun. They started in 1910 with the P, you know, and became the P-13, and, we, you know, and they put a lot into making sure these got built, but by the time the P-14 was actually in production, Britain had kind of moved on and decided, hey, that infield's good enough after all. All our concerns were unwarranted. America, on the other hand, needed rifles so badly and the, the 1917 stepped up, but as soon as it was no longer needed, it was just kind of cast aside as well. It's a shame because uh, Remington, Winchester, and uh, Eddystone did a great job making these, especially under wartime conditions. So I think they're neat for that. And finally, they're getting more recognition these days. But for a long time, they were cheap. On the other hand, you know, Springfield is definitely an American classic. And especially World War I era ones. This is a late war receiver with a World War II replacement barrel. So still mostly has uh, O3 features. It's not an M. It has all the milled parts and stuff. So it's a neat rifle, too. Picked this up at a pawn shop a long time ago. Had this one even longer. But yeah, just thought we would share. If you liked the video, as always, we really appreciate the click there. And if you'd like to help support the channel, please click on the link and check out our Patreon page. This is Misha, and we'll catch you next time.